So, now I'm done. And now I am thrilled to introduce Brad Udall. Brad is the Senior Water and Climate Research Scientist at the Colorado Water Institute, housed at Colorado State University, where he lends his expertise in the, film, the field of water resources and climate change. And he is here, as you probably know, to talk to us about how climate change impacts one of the American West's most valuable water resources, the Colorado River. So with that, I'll pass it over to Brad. So good afternoon or evening, all of you, and thank you all for turning out. What a terrific turnout. And you're going to energize me through what is my third talk in 36 hours. <laughs> so if I look a little bedraggled, it's because I was in Fort Collins yesterday morning in Grand Junction earlier today and now here, talking all about this same topic, Colorado River and climate change. And the river itself is a great metaphor, I think, for everything that's going on around the realm of, of climate. <clears throat> First off, well, let me give myself a little more of an introduction, because many of you asked, are you related in some way to that Udall clan? <laughs> and the answer is all Udalls are related. <clears throat> That's the first part. The second part is, if you know a little of your history, my, for my father was Morris Udall. My uncle was Stuart Udall, Secretary of the Interior under Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, and that means my brother Mark uh, was your senator for a while, and then my cousin Tom is, continues to be a senator in, in New Mexico. But the forebear, in some ways, that I'm most proud of is a guy in the name of John D. Lee. Anybody been to Lee's Ferry on the Colorado River? A few of you. So that's the compact point. That's the point that in 1922, we, we broke the river up into a lower basin and, and an upper basin. And uh, John D. Lee is my great-great-grandfather. So um, you'll see a little passion about this topic because my father and my uncle were really engaged in some of the big battles. And now I find myself sort of cleaning up some of their messes 50-some-odd <laughs> years later. Um, so, um, and. You know, you all recognize this reservoir, right? That's Lake Mead, the single largest reservoir in the United States. And that white band is 150 vertical feet. It represents what's happened during the 20-year drought that started in the year 2000. That's one year's worth of flow out of the river, or 15 million acre feet. So that white band, that's 15 million acre feet, or one year's worth of flow that's missing out of this reservoir, and a bunch more is actually missing out of the reservoir upriver, the Lake Cal Reservoir, upon which the upper basin, including this state, relies upon to make our compact uh, deliveries. So here's some take-home points out of this talk. Um, Climate change is here, it's, it's right now, it's impacting all of us in major ways, right? I mean, this is one of the things that has become increasingly apparent over just the last few years. There's a growing sense of urgency out of the scientific community and economists and increasingly the general public as they grasp the nature of this problem, right? The huge nature of it that's gonna affect all of us in very major ways. In particular, climate change affects the water cycle. And I'm, I'm an author of, of three, co-author of three major assessments, the Intergovernmental Panel Climate Change Assessment in 2014, the U.S. National Climate Assessment in 2009, and the U.S. National Climate Assessment in 2018. And guess what comes at the top, in the top two of concerns when you boil those multi-hundred page reports down, what's in the top two concerns? Water. It's always there. And I'll give you a sense why that is a little further later, but it's affecting both quantity and quality. Colorado River is at high risk of declining flows and increasing demands as it warms. Um, scientists have now coined a term called weather whiplash, right? And it represents 2019 versus 2018 here in our own basin, where we see these things that just feel like, what is going on? <clears throat> And this is a line that came out of the National Climate Assessment that I wrote that says we need to be 
ready for flexible water management strategies for a future we cannot fully foresee because of the whiplashy nature. Um, and let me just say there's also hope here. I mean, climate change gets promoted as this, this losing issue, right, that it's just a bummer for everybody, that we're going to give up our lifestyles. You can't eat hamburgers anymore. God forbid you're going to have to drive an EV. Um, and frankly, much of this is just bunk. There are actually great opportunities embedded in this. As an EV owner on the front range, uh, my little Nissan Leaf, which we got for 15,000 bucks, now has 25,000 miles on it. And it's the first car out of the house every time. My wife and I fight over it. This doesn't just have to be a losing issue. Um, we have the technology, we know the policies right now. And yeah, we don't know how to solve a few things, like air travel is really problematic. And yeah, beef is a little bit of an issue to try and figure out how to deal with the methane. But we're smart enough to figure this out, ultimately. And we don't have to solve those problems right now, but there are a bunch of problems we can solve and have the technology at the right places to solve. Um, Jay Fetcher is a ranch and steamboat, and his father kept this record, and he now keeps it of the melt out in his hay meadow, going all the way back to 1952. And so these are both the, la the latest in the year, on the top in green, and the earliest in the year in the bottom. And notice how, you know, in recent years, we've had these really early meltouts. And 2019 is going to probably be up here somewhere, you know, also in a, in a late period. So kind of fun to see, fun, interesting to see it at work in this state. Here's my, my t-shirt. So five key concepts in, in 10 words. It's warming, man. It's everywhere. The big reports I authored, we often talk about 10 indicators. You know, it's ocean heat content, both deep ocean and in the surface. It's land surface. It's melting glaciers. Of course, it's air temperature is what we all focus on. Um, it's increases in carbon dioxide in, in the ocean that raise um, the pH. Um, so, I mean, there is no doubt that it's warming. There's no reasonable scientists out there that talk about the fact that it's, it's not warming. It's us. I mean, we scientific community has been around and around on this. And if you want to disprove that, you get about eight Nobel Prizes. And guess what? It's not going to happen. I mean, the scientific community has nailed it. It's greenhouse gases. We know it's us. Experts agree. I mean, there's no credible authorities out there that deny this. There are a bunch of people that try and throw sand in our eyes on it. But experts agree it's bad. And then finally, there's hope, um, as I spoke a little bit before. So here's what I'm going to talk about. Um, climate change global and a state look, uh, temperatures and recent assessments. I'm going to tell you how we got to the current state in the Colorado River um, and look at the flows and reservoir levels and all kinds of things. I'm going to talk about the role of climate change in the basin's problems right now. I'm going to introduce you to this term perhaps you've heard called aridification. You know, when you have a drought for 20 years, you probably shouldn't call it a drought. You need a new name for it. And that name is the aridification of the American Southwest. I'm also going to talk about what we think the future looks like in terms of temperature and precip. I'm going to talk a little bit about future management on the river. Um, I'm going to talk kind of about what Jess did. And frankly, my effort there is mostly pretty lame. It's kind of what you can do, um, mostly because this talk's too full, frankly. Um, but I decided a little while ago it was really kind of bad to give people this downer talk and then leave them with nothing they could do. So that's my effort to try and at least provide a little optimism. Um, and then I'll close. So here's the 10 hottest years globally. Um, notice that 70, seven of these years are since 2010, two years in the 2000s, and only one year, 1998, is even in the 20th century. And after this year, which will be record warm again, probably not as warm as 2016, but probably second warmest, um, 1998 will forever disappear into the rearview mirror. Yes? Span of the time that those 10 years were determined to be the 10 
Well, I mean, we're going back to 1998 from 2019. So what is that, 22 years, 23 years at this we're not talking there. No, and I'll show you another graph that puts these in a little better context. Anybody pay attention to Europe this summer? Oh, yeah. Nimes, France, 114 Fahrenheit? And they had this heat wave in June and then one in July. And Greenland, which holds about 20 feet of uh, sea level rise embedded in the ice sheet there, had a melting episode that we think maybe is unprecedented, right? Um, so, I mean, this year was, was plenty bad. So here's um, out of the New York Times, it's official 2018 was the fourth warmest year. This is February 6th of 20, 2019. You can see you know, 2016 is an El Nino. El Ninos tend to be warmer. 98 actually was a El Nino too. It's right there. Um, I heard just the other day, I was testifying at the legislature and someone will remain nameless, suggested that it was cooling because 2017 and 2018 were cooler than 2016. Um, sometimes that's what we're dealing with here, right? Not every year is going to be warmer than the next, and, and people tried to do that with 1998 too, but you can't fool me a second time. Um, 18 of the 19 hottest years since 2001, um, if you want to get a little depressed, last year greenhouse gas emissions globally continued to rise and the scientific community, I mean, we keep hoping that we're going to bend over this curve, right, and that at least greenhouse gas emissions won't go up. But this was due to India and, uh, and China a little bit and also, unfortunately, here in the U.S., um, some transportation, believe it or not, issues here. Um, warming of about one degree Celsius relative to 1750, what we call pre-industrial, before humans were emitting greenhouse gases in large quantities. Um, we could get to 1.5 Celsius by 2040 or 2050, but if we're really unlucky and the climate system sort of provides what we call self-reinforcing feedbacks, we could get there by 2030. Um, the big Paris Climate Accord, right? Um, the commitments that are on the table by the nations of the world, the warming, if you add all those commitments up, put us at three Celsius, which is not so great. But Paris, if you don't know or do know, the idea was each five years, we would try and increase those commitments. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, as I think everybody in this room is aware, we've had negative leadership from Washington on this since President Trump's taken office. Um, weather whiplash, I'll mention again. And also, I'll describe how warming is actually causing these rivers to decline in flow, including the Colorado. And uh, again, if you want to be an optimist, we get to rethink everything we do, which can be a huge opportunity. Um, so here's global US and Colorado temperatures. Um, and uh, this is out of a great report that if you're at all interested that the state of Colorado sponsored in 2014, global here. Um, U.S. and Colorado, U.S. Colorado a little higher than the global trend. Um, and what are we showing here? This is through 2012, which unfortunately doesn't have some of the really hot recent years we've had on here. And uh, yeah. So anybody remember this report that came out in October? So almost a year ago, the IPCC, the governments of the world convened the big uh, scientific panel, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to do a special report on the difference between 1.5 Celsius and 2 Celsius, which is effectively one Fahrenheit difference. And so the scientists went to work and came out with this on October 7th. And it's worth just working you through this. So again, 1 Celsius warming, 2 Fahrenheit worldwide already. Um, 1.5 would be damaging. 2.0 could be intolerable in places. Again, these promises that we have right now lead us to somewhere around three Celsius. Um, and to avoid 1.5, unprecedented actions needed, right? Just, we don't have the, the scale of what's needed now to solve this is, is huge. Um, steep downward emissions needed by 2030, no historical analog. And I've got two takeaways on this report. So first one is um, every 0.1 Celsius is important. Um, 
there's no cliff beyond which it's too late to act. And if you try and square this, this three Celsius that we're headed for, um, with you know, to trying to hit 1.5, you can be a little depressed. But let me just tell you that a um, good analogy is if you're on the freeway at 80 miles an hour and you miss your exit, well, you go on to the next one and get off, right? You don't just keep blasting down the freeway. So we are going to exceed some of these targets, but by gosh, um, there are things we can still do to avoid the worst. And the other thing I'll tell you is that the real focus here is on net, what scientists now call net zero uh, emissions. Net zero means there may be some things that we can't avoid emitting, agriculture, for example, but the idea of negative emissions, some technologies we have or will have to pull carbon dioxide actually out of the atmosphere, or you're going to hear more and more about those. Um, and some of them are passive, like good farming techniques, and some of them might be actually more active, um, like literally devices that pull CO2 out. <clears throat> Here's the fourth national climate assessment. Again, was one of the many authors on this, 400 of us. Um, and there were, were a bunch of findings, but you've heard this, impacts already. And those impacts include fires, floods, droughts, and hurricanes. In fact, um, Western fires, about twice the acreage uh, is burning that would, than would otherwise occur in the absence of climate change. So um, 1x without climate change, 2x with. Um, it's, it is really adding to the acreage being burned. Um, again, we know it's going to disrupt life. And again, we've made a call for mitigation and adaptation both. Mitigation being, of course, the term that scientists use to talk about pulling, the, the stopping greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and again, I just note water quality changing. So <clears throat> let me move on to the Colorado River and uh, talk about it. Here's the upper and lower basins. And all those arrows represent diversions. So every major city in the American Southwest, including those out of the basin, actually get water out of this system, including Santa Fe and Albuquerque, and of course, Colorado's Front Range. Cheyenne, Wyoming even has figured out a way to get Colorado River water. Um, Las Vegas is 90% dependent on, on uh, Colorado River water, and you saw on that first slide, Lake Mead and Hoover Dam, Las Vegas just spent $1.5 billion building an intake into the very bottom of that lake so that they could continue to have a reliable supply because they are so dependent upon it. In Arizona, um, water flows uphill toward money, right? The old rule in Western water. Um, it flows 300 miles via the Central Arizona Project into Tucson and Phoenix, 3,000 vertical foot lift, uh, 400 megawatts. And in my father's era, they actually built a power plant on Glen Canyon that's now going to get shut down called Navajo Generating Station to provide some of the power for that. Um, like many coal-fired power plants, Navajo Generating Station is just facing hard economics right now, and there's cheaper power. It's a little bit of a sad story, though, because both the Hopi tribe and the Navajo tribe are really dependent on the revenues out of NGS. Um, Los Angeles, 25% of their water comes out of the Colorado River system. San Diego gets Colorado River water. Most of your winter produce is actually grown here in the Imperial Irrigation District that takes 20% of the flow of the river. Um, Yuma also grows in, on the Arizona side um, vegetables in the, in the winter. So it kind of gives you an idea of sort of where this water goes, how important it is. About 50. The front range is about 50%. 50 percent. 5-0. Five zero. Five zero. Um, and they're particularly at risk because they use that water not once but multiple times. And so that 50 percent actually almost understates the, how reliant they are on that system. Can you uh, explain multiple times? So under Colorado water law, you actually get one crack at using water. If it's, if it's water within your native system, so you can go you know, put it on your lawn once. Um, in the case of what's called foreign water, or water that's imported from another basin, you can actually fully consume it. So you as a homeowner, for example, 
might think consuming water is taking a shower. That's actually not consuming water, right? Half, most of that shower water ends up at the sewer treatment plant back in the river. When you're in the water business, you pay particular attention to consumption, which is water that's no longer available. It's been evaporated. Um, it's been transpired, that is to say, run through plants and evaporated. Um, it's somehow no longer in the current hydrologic system. It will get back later in form of rain or snow somewhere else, but it's no longer available, no longer available. for use. Um, the seven states, you can see the upper basin four there, Colorado, Utah, uh, Wyoming, and um, am I drawing a blank here? Um, so three talks in 36 hours. And New Mexico actually is upper basin too. A couple of these states like Arizona and New Mexico actually have both weird upper and lower basin uh, aspects. And the three lower basin states, um, Nevada, uh, Arizona, and, and California here. Um, and Mexico actually gets 10% of the flow as well. Um, it's the annual flow of the Hudson. It's not very big. We talk in terms of acre feet. Acre feet's a weird unit, 325,000 gallons, size of an Olympic swimming pool. Um, 15 million of them historically. But since 2000, we're, we're about 20, almost 20% 20 down. 40 million people, I mentioned all this, all major cities, a whole bunch of irrigated acreage, fully allocated by a famous compact in 1922. Um, and around 2,000 water withdrawals equaled supplies. People still want to build new projects. Uh, Utah wants to build a, a Lake Powell pipeline from Lake Powell over to St. George. Um, Aaron Million wants to build a project from here on the Green River into the Front Range of Colorado, believe it or not. And finally, it no longer reaches the ocean. Um, this little blue line, that's actually a lie. For 50 some odd years, we've taken it all. Uh, Mexico has basically taken, taken it all. Um, at what's left, the 10% the or so that's left that they're entitled to by treaty. Question. So how much, how much can price help us is kind of your question, right? So economists have often said, well, well let's just pay farmers. I mean, they use 75% of this water. Why not just pay them? It should be, they should be you know, equal to money or water, right? Well, it turns out if you're a farmer, that's not a very good deal for you because if you don't grow in one year, the markets you've set up, the labor you have contracted for, um, no longer, it, that's a problem. Like, th they want to grow stuff. Um, and so one has to have some sympathy for agricultural producers who are just told, we're going to take your water, here's money in lieu of it. Um, it can help in some cases. Um, it certainly can help people uh, in municipal environments realize they need to conserve, um, but it's not always the answer because water has what are called public good aspects, right? It's not just like any other good. It provides all kinds of other ancillary services. You know, the water that you can go fly fish in over here or run your kayak in, um, those are benefits too and typically not monetized. The public kind of gets the benefit of that, right? Um, so let me just walk you through um, sort of where we are in the current Colorado River sequence of things. So Lake Mead gets filled in 1935. In 1963, Lake Powell, we build it, that fills. Drought begins right here. You can see this historic decline. We lose about 50%. Um, these reservoirs are almost full at the beginning, and we lose 50% much of it in the first five years, when flows in the system are about two-thirds of normal. Um, here, and here's a, a trend of upper basin flows going all the way back to 1906. This period, this trend line's a little deceptive in that this was a really wet period, and so it kind of cranks that linear line up. Um, probably the wettest period in the last 800 years, if you look at tree rings. Um, it also allowed the compact negotiators to allocate more water than we actually have, um, which is nowadays a problem. But this decline out here clearly has a, a climate change component that I'm going to get into. Precip mostly flat, all the way back to 1895, lots of year-to-year -year variability, and then here are these temperatures. 
um, two Fahrenheit warming um, uh, uh, relative to the 20th century now, and it continues to go up, and that warming is impacting our supplies. On the second part there, how about the increase in the white area? So in natural flows, yep. right here? So that's the 1980s. Anybody was here in the 1980s, 82, 83, big El Nino year? Um, we think just natural variability, no known otherwise cause. And you, period, of course, was called the Little Ice Age. Well, the Little Ice Age actually is more in the 1400s. This is actually in the 1980s, so that's 400 years <laughs> before. Well, I suppose if you want to call it the Little Ice Age, you can. In the 50s, we're cooler, um, but that's more back in this dry drought that's called, that's he, called out here. It's been 800 years. And then wow. early 1920s. Yeah. No, we don't know. I mean, what we do know in our climate system is we see both decadal, we see what scientists call decadal variability, which just means it gets wet for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. But those are, as you said, those were the wettest in Probably 800. Something. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean maybe if we had better instrumentation back then we might be able to tease it out. But the, our climate system is really variable. Um, on a regional, on a regional basis, when you look at global temperatures, they should be really solid, and that's based on pure physics. Actually, incoming energy from the sun has got to be equal to. Uh, outgoing energy from the Earth. And what greenhouse gases do is change that equation and capture some of that outgoing energy and then warm the planet. Um, so it's, you know, when, when I talk about two Fahrenheit warming, a lot of people think, oh, no big deal, man. Yesterday it was 10 Fahrenheit cooler, tomorrow it's gonna be 20 Fahrenheit warmer. That's the wrong metric, right? On an annual basis, Earth's temperatures are really stable and they're also very stable regionally. Um, we just don't have the memory to kind of figure out what an annual temperature should feel like. Yes? So I will tell you, people have gotten very interested in the reintroduction of beavers, believe it or not, which is a lot more direct connection to a river system, right, than wolves. Um, beavers created these natural wetlands at very high elevations, right, and those wetlands both stored and then later released water. I don't know enough to comment on that, but it's at least an intriguing idea. And earlier I was asked, well, what happened this year on a reservoir content? So here's Powell and Mead. This is just this little section of Powell and Mead con combined contents. Again, two largest reservoirs in the United States. You can see them full there on the left at 46 million acre feet. This is what happened this year, that little blip. You need about four of those or five of them to refill the system. And I was, as I told you, I was just at a presentation earlier today. This is 2011. Anybody remember 2011? Anybody, any sense in the room? I mean, this is a hard question, but I thought this year might be the equivalent of 2011. 2011 had 20 million acre feet of runoff. It was a really big year. Um, top five in history of the system. You would have expected this year to actually generate more runoff than it did, frankly. Um, and there's a little story to that that I'm going to get into here. So this is a super complicated diagram. Um, I almost shudder that I have this in here, but <laughs> summer temperature in the upper Colorado River Basin, winter precip in inches, which determines our runoff, right? It's all mostly snow melt in the Colorado River system. Each dot's a year, going back to 1950. Um, red dots are from 2000 on, and the size of the dot is the size of the flow. And so you can see a 15 million acre foot dot is that big, and the circle, that black circle, represents 15 million acre feet. So it allows you to scale a small year. So what do you note about the red dots? Where do they fall? Mostly here. Hot and dry, right? Um, and so, anyway, there are a bunch of animations, I think, here. So that I all told you. So since 2000, only 10% of the years fall over in that cool and dry or cool and wet quadrant, only two of them. Those years, we're not gonna see those cool years going forward. Six years, 
fall up here in the wet part, that's um, about 30%, greater than average winter precip. And 70% fall in that quadrant there. That's our future right there, that quadrant, unfortunately. And that's part of this whole notion of aridification. And uh, only four years are actually above average precip. So in the 20 years since 2000, uh, under normal, a normal climate, 10 of those, 50% of them would have been above average. Um, we're having about half of that right now. And so this is 2018, just a year ago, right? Um, I'm not quite sure how warm it was here, but this is data, NOAA data, National Weather Service data, going back to 1895. And these red colors, record warmest or record driest. Large part, that's large parts of the basin, right? And this record warm you know, got way up north, even into Wyoming. Um, and something, I don't know if you noticed, but the last couple of months here have been really hot and dry, right? I spent last week hiking in the Wind River Mountains in Wyoming, which are the headwaters of the green, part of the Colorado River system. It was bone dry at 10,000 feet. Creeks less than five feet wide were gone. I mean, there was nothing there. Creeks that were bigger were full of algae and had greatly diminished flows. And in large part due to um, this very warm atmosphere and hot temperatures that want to increase our evaporative load. And I'll just mention here, um, so here's what happened in Lake Powell. Um, gray colors are pre-2007 and there was a big agreement in 2007. These are different important levels in the reservoir that I don't think I'm going to much talk about. Uh, but again, this year was not as big as 2011, despite having actually more precipitation. It's more like 2005. Here's Powell going up in 2005. Here's this year. Um, it's unlikely to be our future. Um, and I'll note that people think we can't set cold records anymore. Well, we do. We set them in a ratio of about one to two right now. So for every cold record, we get two warm records. Uh, by 2050, we think that ratio is like one to 20. And by 2100, it's like one to 40. So we'll still set cold records somewhere in the planet. It's just not, the ratio is shifting. And so we can have a year like this. And Lake Powell's only up year to year it's only up about 20 feet here, believe it or not, 2 million acre feet, 10, less than 10%. Um, and both reservoirs about 55%. Two years ago? No. Years ago. No, no, no. Um, I mean, this year goes up because we have a big runoff. But again, I'll get to the, the reason why 2019 is not as big as one might have hoped. Um, just wait. So, you know, I, I mentioned earlier how all these climate assessments have water change or the issues of, of water right in the top 10 list, and I noted top two or three. Um, so, so why is that? So our water cycle is actually heat driven, right? Um, vast quantities of water every day get evaporated from the ocean, the Pacific here in yellow, believe it or not. Uh, huge quantities. And that water vapor then moves places, much of it just reprecipitates re-precipitates back on the ocean, but some of it makes it to continents. Well, as it warms, this whole water cycle is going to fundamentally change, in part because the atmosphere actually holds more moisture. It's about 4% um, per, per degree Fahrenheit, or if it warms 5 Fahrenheit, 20% more increase. And this is part of the reason why, for example, we now see um, in Hurricane Harvey 60 inches of precipitation falling on Houston, 60 inches, because this atmosphere now holds more. It's a bigger sponge. And when the conditions exist for that moisture to precipitate out, you end up with these huge dumps. Um, and it happens on our snow as well. When you heat up the Earth and you heat it unevenly, the Arctic now warming about twice as fast as elsewhere, you actually change weather patterns and what we end up with is more evaporation, more precipitation, in general, more moisture, but changes in weather patterns and regional winners and losers. Um, more intense floods and more intense droughts. It feels really unfair that we get both of those, but we do. 
And we're already noting all these changes. So more rain and less snow, especially if you're in the Pacific Northwest, where it, it, the snow is real close to 32 Fahrenheit. Um, earlier runoff, so earlier springs, higher water temperature, more intense rainfall. All this stuff we're already seeing, and it's really fundamental to a warmer planet. Sorry, quick comment? Yeah. So, so let me counter. Um, one of the things we've noted with uh, hurricanes and other storm systems right now under climate change, and some of you probably at least are vaguely aware of this, is these weather patterns tend to lock in place right now. We end up with a wavier jet stream that wants to stick in place. And that's part of the reason Houston got more moisture for sure, that that, that storm was really slow moving. But it was also juiced by this atmosphere that actually held more moisture. So you're right, there are a couple different reasons there. Okay, we can disagree. But um, that's what scientists tell us about partly what's going on here. Um, so I just want to talk about this notion of Hadley cells, uh, invention of a scientist back in the 1700s. Um, and what Hadley noted is that there's a lot of evaporation at the equator. Rising air cools. Cool air actually holds less moisture, and, and hence it has to precipitate out. Um, and so that's hence these clouds here. Then you get what's called, uh, again, a Hadley cell. That, that dry air now moves poleward and then descends at about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And if you ever look at a map of the world's deserts, that's where they occur, 30 north and 30 south, because of that dry descending air that wants to dry out what's underneath it. And what we have seen both in paleoclimate studies and in our models is these Hadley cells actually broaden. They move poleward as it warms. And so if we have deserts to our south of the Colorado River system, those deserts are headed our way. And that's an, yet another reason why there's worry about at least the southern portion of this basin, this Colorado River basin, including the San Juan Mountains, drying. Um, and ha what Hadley didn't know about, I mean, it's a beautiful theory, dates to 1750, are jet streams, actually, um, that sit actually at the junction of these cells, because those jet streams both create and then track weather. So if you hear the term storm track associated with these jet streams that oftentimes sit at the edge of a Hadley cell. So what kind of action? Volcanic action. All right, so above and below sea level. OK, so there are volcanoes both above the ocean, right? And there's these Atlantic and, and Pacific ridges where they're the effective um, you have basalt spreading centers where, that are like volcanoes, right? We don't see them, so we don't think about them. Volcanoes do emit CO2, but in very small quantities relative to what humans emit, on the order of about 1%. And over very long terms in the history of the Earth's climate, volcanoes have actually played an important stabilizing role. When it's gotten really cold, volcanoes have emitted CO2 over eons that has then slowly warmed the planet and has helped kick the Earth out of several snowball Earth episodes. Right now, they're actually a tiny, tiny portion of the greenhouse gas emissions that we count anywhere. So they're not really a factor. There's another way volcanoes influence our climate, which is really big ones like Mount Pinatubo emit large quantities of sulfur dioxide, which actually temporarily cools the planet. It's a particle that gets ejected high in the atmosphere and actually then will cool the atmosphere for two or three years until those particles sink out, sulfur dioxide. And if you have heard of the term geoengineering, which might give some of you concerns, one of the ways to geoengineer the planet is to use this same mechanism to put sulfur dioxide artificially high in the atmosphere to get that same cooling. Huge debate over is that good, bad, should we even study it? But that's sort of the role of volcanoes, both in the long term and short term. Um, this is IPCC figure. And again, I noted those world's deserts, those Hadley cells. And look at these areas where they talk about runoff declining in red both at 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south, Mediterranean, Great Plains, American Southwest, South Africa, Chile, and uh, tiny portions of, of Australia. 
And uh, all right, so, so now I'm going to get to what's going on. Why are these flows declining? This is a paper by a bunch of University of Arizona, USGS, um, University of Nevada, Reno, and more GS, USGS scientists. And what they did in 2016 was plot here water year flow. So water year is what engineers talk about with um, western snowmelt driven rivers because a water year runs from um, October through September because that's the cycle that repre best represents a year. Um, a calendar year has sort of two different, very different climatological regimes in it. And so we use water years to try and characterize what happens. And then they also graphed uh, October to April precipitation and they, they create what are called percentiles. So that you can actually graph these things that are measured in two different ways on the same graph. And you would think, and, and then there's this idea of runoff efficiency. So for a given amount of precip, you'd think you'd get the same amount of runoff. And what this graph shows is that over time, runoff efficiency has really changed. So back in the 1920s, here we have precipitation below runoff, meaning that we're actually getting more runoff than we would expect out of that given amount of precip. And Connie and her authors color these years where runoff efficiency is high in greens and blues, and then years when it's low in these sort of tan and purple colors. And if you look at this again, the purple side is over here, right, indicating that in recent years, we've actually seen less runoff efficiency. For a given amount of precip, less water is showing up in the river. Yeah? No, although the groundwater connection is interesting and in that a lot of people nowadays think that there's a definite connection with groundwater in the system and that every year when you see some runoff, it's actually last year's groundwater that's being forced out in an interesting buffer. So basically this year's water refills the buffer and forces out groundwater from last year, runoff from last year that's been temporarily stored as, as, as groundwater. But no, no sense that groundwater has really much changed. In fact, um, there are a couple NASA satellites that are now not operational that have the capability to look at groundwater at very gross scales. And what they have shown over the last 20 years are pretty good declines in groundwater. And these, um, believe it or not, these satellites work on the concept of gravity. Water's heavy. Um, when these two satellites pass, they send a laser beam between them. And when they get over a heavier part of the Earth, one that has water in it, they actually dip down and go slightly faster. And they can measure the distance between these two satellites and then translate that into a gravity mass underneath them. And we've done that in the Colorado River Basin. And it shows, in particular, in the worst part of the, the drought declines, decreases in groundwater. And so what Connie and her authors came up with were these three ideas that normally we think precip's the main driver of drought, but in fact, temperature can be a driver too. And that since 1988, flows have been less than we've expected given the winter precip. And that warmer, the cause here is warmer temperatures exacerbated modest precipitation deficits in what she and others and, and I are calling the millennium drought. And then there have been other work like this that I did with um, Jonathan Overpeck, now of the University of Michigan. And we called the 1950s drought a dry drought driven by a lack of precipitation, but this current drought a hot drought. Um, driven in part, at least, by these higher temperatures. And if you look at the data, you can only explain about two-thirds of the loss in flow due to declines in precipitation. And you have to invoke temperature to then come up with the remaining one-third. Why? It's hotter. It evaporates more on any given day. You're going to have higher temperatures. We now have a longer growing season. We have um, opportunities in the winter because of warmer temperatures for snow to go directly from snow into vapor form called sublimation. And of course, this thirstier atmosphere, this moisture holding capacity increase in the atmosphere also helps drive this. And so now we've lost about 6% of the flow in the river. 
If you look at temperature projections, you end up with a potential 20% decline by 2050 and maybe 35% by 2100 based on really good projections on temperature. Mind you, a wide range, but known, known increases. And that, those numbers um, uh, are if precipitation stays flat, which is not a bad guess. Um, it's a guess that we have to make right now given the huge variability in the climate models. You know, good question. Um, yeah, it's going somewhere else in the atmosphere. And what you see globally is areas to the north wetting. And uh, if I went back to that uh, IPCC figure that showed runoff, you'd actually see runoff increases in northern areas. So uh, in this country, Midwest, Northeast, Canada, expect to see more precip, and they actually are. So that's where it's headed, unfortunately. Um, this is just another study I did, and I'm actually, in the interest of time, going to skip it. Um, <laughs> dust on snow. Um, how many of you heard this idea, dust on snow? So uh, a study back in uh, 2010. Those are the San Juans there, right? That dirty snowpack in the springtime absorbs more solar energy than a nice bright white snowpack, and so it melts sooner. And here you can see. Um, before any kind of dust in blue, this is an annual J January through December runoff or hydrograph. The, without any dust, it's higher and later in the season. With dust, it shifts earlier, about three weeks potentially, um, and reduces the snowpack by about 5%. And again, it's that dark surface that absorbs solar energy. And the dust is coming out of northern Arizona and uh, southern Utah. Um, going forward, of course, we expect to see declines in what are called um, snow water equivalents. So these are projections mid-century for declines in the, the water content of our snowpack throughout the West. You can see April to July runoff um, decreasing. In places like California, they'll actually get earlier runoff um, and as well here, but not as pronounced because it won't warm as much. Being mid-continent actually makes this place colder and uh, increases in, uh, or decreases in soil moisture also. There's also this concept of um, mega drought that my co-author Overpeck really popularized back around 2000. And it turns out in the 19, 1950 to 2000, using three different measures, the opportunity we think to have these really long lasting uh, mega droughts was roughly about 10%. At least that's sort of what our models tell us. Unfortunately, as it warms, the climate cycle is full of these self-reinforcing feedbacks that make it much more possible to get these long-lasting droughts. And several studies have validated this idea that we're at much greater risk of these very long droughts, of which some we see in the tree record, but climate change actually is, is a game changer on this as well. So I think the Great Lakes are actually probably OK, just because they're far enough north. Um, that's my sense. And, um, but the American Southwest just sits in this very unusual place where it's, it's much like the Mediterranean and those other areas I pointed out, uh, uh, Chile uh, in Australia, right South Africa, with the Hadley cell risk of, of drying. Um, that would be my answer. Yeah. And, so, I mean, I, I mentioned this term of aridification, um, and uh, this is just an aridity index uh, mid-century, just how it, we think it dries out. And there are all these reasons to think that the American Southwest is particularly um, at, at risk. And, and I'm, frankly, I've gone through almost all of these before, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. So here's what some of the models project. Um, this is a generation old, but I like this image. Drying to the south in red, wetting to the north here. Um, th this is percentile. Um, Colorado kind of sits in the middle of this. And uh, so the southern part of the state, more at risk. We're not really sure where this line is. Different models show different things. Different generations of models show different things. But I will tell you, southern Colorado, and especially the southern portion of the basin, is really at risk of precipitation and runoff declines. Um, and I'll just point out 
you know, if you live in a city, you tend to think precipitation is runoff, right? It falls on a concrete surface like out here, it immediately turns to water. You see it run off into a storm sewer, and you assume it makes it into the river. Well, that field doesn't operate that way at all. There's a huge environmental tax on that field and in nature, right? About 90% of what falls on that uh, field out there goes into evapotranspiration, the plants use it, or it just plain out evaporates, and only a small portion makes it into the river. That environmental tax under climate change goes up significantly. Um, these are kind of projections for Southwest Colorado, mostly because I have them. Um, and what I'm trying to tell you is at least here, um, within these projections, you kind of see a range, a 20th century range in, um, in this blue bar, actually in the dots, excuse me, and then the climate model change in blue. Median here, you can see some decreases in May and June, then an earlier uh, end of winter, um, and, and some declines here, right? But more or less within natural variability, um, again, with some shading low. But temperatures are really different. And um, so mid-century Denver, 2.5 to 6.5 Fahrenheit warming, end century 5.5 to 9. And if you want to get some analogs, if it warms to Fahrenheit in Denver annually, that means Denver has a climate of Pueblo. At four, it's like Lamar. And at six, you don't even have a Colorado analog. You've got to go down to Albuquerque to find a six Fahrenheit warmer annual climate temperature. And six Fahrenheit is at the low end of these end century projections. Um, and again, here's the temperature projections. Um, kind of similar graph. There's the 20th century, 21st century, not even in the same league, right? Uh, and uh, they're just way outside what we've experienced naturally. Um, this is just a little piece I wrote recently about how to manage this river going forward. In 2007, we had a whole set of uh, uh, guidelines that were put in place via a formal EIS process. They expire in 2026. We begin our renegotiations next year. Um, it, this year, something called the DCP was passed by the US Congress and all the basin states. Um, it buys us some time, but it really didn't solve any of the major problems, including overuse in the lower basin. Um, this 2026 new agreement gives us an opportunity to rethink this entire system. And today over in Grand Junction, much of the discussion there was what that might look like. Um, so, you know, a lot of people think price on carbon fixes it, right? And let's get a price on carbon. Not even close to what we need. Um, we need incentives for technology adoption. We need regulations. Uh, we need research and development investments at the, at the federal level. These are the EPA sources. EPA uh, required a report on U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. And if you're savvy, you know that electric power is down, right, relative to the, all the coal-fired power plant reductions. And now the number one emissions in the U.S. is transportation. Um, that's our next big challenge. It's a lot harder than electric power, where you have 300 units roughly around the U.S., and if you can get to them, you can make a meaningful dent. Transportation, you know, it's 100 million plus cars in the US, I think a billion worldwide. Um, they last 20 years. And, uh, and, and you got to have the technology to, to replace uh, gas and, and diesel with something better. Um, as an EV owner, I actually love my EV. Ford, GM have many models coming in the very near future. And I am convinced they are better cars once you solve the battery range problem. And in this climate, it's a little bit of a challenge, in part because they don't have a built-in source of heat, right, like a normal internal combustion car. Yes, sir? Are these uh, figures still current, or have they been thrown? These are through 2018. Um, this is the 2018 report here. If that's, you're asking if the figures were current, right? Yes. Yep. You can see ag and commercial. I mean, there are all these different pieces we need to get at. Uh, what can you do? Um, you know, Jess actually had probably a lot better list, and I'm almost embarrassed to put this up. But, um, you know, this, 
So Ben Franklin exited the Constitutional Convention one day and a woman on the street asked him, what do we have? Do we have a republic or do we have a democracy? And if you're a little sketchy on civics, a republic, right, is a representative democracy. And his answer was, we have a republic if you can keep it. And what he meant was, I think, that voters have got to be engaged in our democratic process or the whole thing dries up and, and shrivels and you end up with scoundrels in office. And as, as my uncle Stuart would say. And, um, um, 18 to 29 year olds voting at you know, half the rate of older people, yet this issue Im will impact more, them more than anyone else. If you know a one year old right now, that one year old will be, likely be alive in 2100. So this is not some kind of out there issue. Um, vote and get others to vote. You know, the sociologists tell us just talking about this issue is actually good. It takes it out of the realm of kind of the dirty partisan realm that somehow we found ourselves in. I mean, if you can wait for a few years to buy an EV, that's a feel-good effort. Um, I mean, PVs are great, right? Um, uh, in home, in I mean, all these great technologies. I cooked on an induction burner recently, and it's a lot better than my gas, I gotta tell you. It's faster, it's easier to clean, there's nothing not to like about it. Sure, there are hard things out there, air travel, um, beef bur burgers, um, your diet, perhaps, but within this state, um, 2019 was a banner year for uh, statewide action, and, and I'll note, ultimately, all these things that make you feel good, they're great, but what we got to have is collective action to solve this. I mean, here's some of the stuff that went on at the legislature. Um, if you want, I mean, there's, this is a list that put out that goes to three pages, um, a, a climate action plan, um, uh, the Air Quality Control Commission to help with these new state goals, clean energy standards, um, more data actually to help us figure out what's going on. Um, you know, Excel actually has stepped up to the plate and is one of the better electricity providers in the nation right now. Um, and there's some efforts, there was some legislation around what they were doing willingly with Excel. Um, an EV infrastructure program for chargers around the state. This state has the most beneficial EV tax credit to anywhere in the nation right now. Um, community solar gardens, just transition to, for dealing with these communities that are gonna lose, right? What do we do with those folks? I mean, as Americans, we owe it to these people to figure out how to get a path forward. Um, so, I went through this and I'm gonna actually just do this. Well, I got two, two quick slides, you all been great. Um, it's here, it's impacting our, our river um, the temperatures for sure. Um, this precipitation decline I didn't much talk about. We can't really say if it's natural or if there's a climate signal in there. These impacts get worse. I don't like the term new normal. Aridification is actually a better term. Uh, new abnormal might actually be okay, but uh, doesn't uh, plan on hotter everywhere, shifting runoff patterns more weather variability, this flow reduction risk. I haven't much talked about floods, but I lived through the 2013 Front Range flood. 17 inches of precipitation, a year's worth in four days in Boulder. My house, frankly, was uh, unscathed, but multiple billions of dollars of damage went into that, and again, this juicier atmosphere helped facilitate this. And I haven't much talked about fires, um, but also risks there good opportunity for change. You know, this is Paradise, California. 86 people died. I think the numbers I've heard are $16 billion in damage. Single most costly fire in U.S. history, and the second one's not even close. Those are, each red dot there is a, a structure that was destroyed, 20,000 of them. Um, and climate change clearly made this worse. Um, did it cause it? No. But did it make it worse? Yes, and that's oftentimes the issue with climate change. It takes some existing threat and makes it worse. Um, so I've had the privilege of working on it for 16 years, two national climate assessments, um, one international assessment, one state assessment. And with each year this threat grows, um, water has been and will continue to be a huge challenge just because of its direct connection to the temperature of the Earth. 
Um, good news, or perhaps good news, is you know, during the past six months, I will tell you, nary a week passes without some kind of profound event, be it political, scientific, or extreme climate event that gets inflicted on us. And this year, it's, it's coming up on, or this week, it's this Friday, right? Um, we have the tools to minimize this. Um, we just need to choose that path. And, and as I said earlier today, I mean, I, this nation we, we live in, it truly is a talented and great nation, right? And if you believe that, and you know that we are the world's largest economy, I will then tell you we have a duty to lead here. The rest of the world, there's only about 20 nations actually you really got to worry about. China's living up to their Paris commitments. If we lead, others will follow. And we truly are great. We have it within us to do this. And as Churchill said, um, I'll leave you with this famous Churchill quote that came out of World War II. And he said, you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other alternative. <laughs> All right, I'm done. And I don't know how long you want to torture yourself. Yes, sir. So, do I have an image of Mead in here? I don't think I do. Yeah, I will. Um, all right, so the question resolved, there's a wonky question around Lake Mead. Um, and so this is Lake Mead going back to the year 2000. It's lost 15 million acre feet. Um, it's a 25 million acre foot reservoir. And you can see it here. The question is, what happens when Mead falls below 1075? And these colors represent parts of the agreement in 2007 for when the lower basin would actually get shortages, when they would not get deliveries out of Lake Mead. And these first three were decided in 2007, and then the blue was agreed upon this year as part of what I called the drought contingency plan. And just in August of this year, and this is through August 1, just in August of this year, Reclamation issued its forecast for January 1, 2020, Lake Mead. And what that forecast was for below 1090, meaning that for the first time ever, uh, the lower basin will actually have to deal with water delivery shortages. Those mostly fall on Arizona, but Mexico actually takes a portion, uh, and Nevada takes a portion. And you might ask, why not California? Well, the history there is when my father and my uncle Stuart uh, were uh, Stuart being Secretary of the Interior, my father is one of three congressmen in Arizona trying to get the Central Arizona Project authorized. The price they paid for getting California to sign on in 1968 with its 37 representatives in the U.S. House was that Arizona would be the first entity to take shortages if there ever wasn't enough water in the lower basin. So I now, as Mo Udall's son, get to see the first ever shortage on this project that, that my father and, and my uncle actually promoted. And um, it's just sort of interesting to see that happen. These shortages get more severe and severe as the levels go down. And the lower basin right now is overusing its allocation to the tune of about 1.2 million acre feet per year. It's, it has, even has a term called the structural deficit. Structural in this case meaning not uh, you know, built in concrete, but, but very hard to deal with. I mean, everybody's dependent upon this water. So long-winded answer to your question about 1075. I morphed it into a question about 1090, but they could hit 1075 at some point, too. Can I go into what the shortages are like? So in 2000, I mentioned the structural deficit, 1.2 million acre feet. In 2007, well, in 2004, when Meade was about here, Secretary of the Interior Gail Norton said to the upper base, said to the entire basin, you have no plan to deal with this. You've never dealt with shortages. You have three years to put a plan in place. 
Out of that came the 2007, what are called interim guidelines. And because all of these fell on Arizona and the politics were so difficult, they only agreed to 600,000 or half of the structural deficit in shortages. And that 600,000 was triggered by steps as you went down these levels. Fast forward to 2012 and 2013, Big, big year in 2011, and so the Upper Basin makes a major release to Lake Mead here. It goes up. Guess what? They managed to blow that in three years, 2012 through 2014 here. And all of a sudden, people realize those two 7,000, 2007 guidelines, they're not enough. We need more. And so they started working on what's now called the DCP. And the DCP actually has 1.4 million acre feet in shortages now that are layered on top of these existing tiers and then a new tier was added. That's the good news. The bad news on the DCP is they pulled a little bit, I think a little bit of a fast one in that these shortages are real shortages. You don't get that delivery, you never get that water. It's gone. The DCP shortages, you get a credit for those shortages, and you can claim those later when the reservoir recovers. <laughs> Interesting, eh? And it's why the upper basin objected to not being included in the DCP process. And in some ways, the DCP process was flawed because it didn't involve a full EIS. The modeling was not publicly available. Um, Good news is it only lasts through 2026. And those 1.4 million acre feet, they'll protect Mead from disaster. Um, and, and, and they serve their purpose, but they don't even begin to solve the structural deficit despite the 1.4 million acre feet in shortage that you look at and think, oh, that's great. We solved our problem. Question? I'll, I'll get over to you. Let me do this gentleman first. You know, it'd be, be a good idea. I mean, a lot of people are now talking about the farm bill, right, is one way to get at ag, agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, which worldwide are about 25% of the problem. Healthy soils, you probably heard about, trying to stash carbon back in soils. When you plow soils, you actually expose it to oxygen, the carbon that's in those soils and volatizes. That's been the history of, of farming. The idea here would be to pay people through various aspects of the farm bill to do something similar. Your idea is kind of on the water side of that. Um, it, it's good, but I know nothing of it. I, I know nothing of any ideas. Yes, sir. Just uh, since the issue is global climate change, just a quick clarification. Uh, you mentioned that China is conforming with the Paris with their Paris Accords. Um, we should all know that China is the number one emitter of greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. They're building a coal-fired power plant per week, and their commitments don't take effect till 2030. So, yeah, they're complying, but they don't have anything to comply with. So, yeah, so you get into equities between the developing world and the developed world. Climate, I actually think your number on, on coal-fired power plants is now down and not totally accurate. Um, they, 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 they realize, I mean, part of the reason they're cleaning up is that, I mean, if anybody knows anything about the dirty air in Beijing, you know there's a real reason for them to actually not burn coal. Um, so they have incentives otherwise to clean up their energy supply. You know, they are the world's largest greenhouse gas emitter, but their per capita emissions are, I would argue, about a tenth of ours. Um, U.S., you know, we're, we're right at the head of the pack. Canada's in there with us. Australia's in there with us, you know, roughly 20 tons per person per year. You all are fairly affluent as am I, and our emissions are probably significantly higher than that. Um, and, and so the Chinese per capita emissions, again, about one-tenth of that. And again, much of those emissions are actually due to products that they then sell elsewhere. So how you account for that, there's a little bit of a bugaboo, right, in that we probably are responsible for a pretty good chunk of those emissions that at least nominally we attribute to them in any kind of simplistic accounting. Uh, well, yeah, lots of questions just here. Just out of curiosity, what percent of the upper and what percent of the lower goes to agriculture? 
So in both upper and lower basin, and this is actually true worldwide, roughly 75% of water use goes to ag. And you might think that they're really simple solutions. You just take a little out of ag and everybody else has a lot more. Turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. And again, another reason I mentioned earlier about ag, these ag communities tend to be driven by ag, right? So it's their whole economic base. And if you hurt that ag base, it's then the seed dealer and the grocer and the tractor dealer that get hurt. Um, the economies are not very well diversified, and so that's why they get really sensitive, and rightfully so, about giving up some of their water. Not like that, isn't it a ground cover issue? Is, isn't it a ground cover? Ground cover issue? I mean, if you leave a field... So, so Sure, so, so fallowing is an issue just because of um, wind-blown dust and dirt and weeds and other issues as well. You're, you're right, and most fallowing agreements around the West enforce some kind of care upon the farmer in exchange for releasing money for taking care of that soil, at least trying to. Um, yes? So, yeah, so, so the climate model precipitation in some areas of the planet is really quite uncertain, and we happen to sit in one of these areas, you know, where the transition from, you know, models show both wetting and drying, depending on which model and which generations of model you have. Certain areas very clearly wetting, certain areas like Mexico very clearly drying. Much more problematic here. Part of the issue with climate models and precipitation is that the resolution of these models right now, they still use a lot of statistics as opposed to physics to come up with precipitation numbers because they're not what are called cloud resolving models, the square, the grid boxes on which they resolve. That's not true with temperatures. Temperatures out of this, these models are pure physics based, and that's why when somebody like I talk, you know, these temperature increases are really well known. You can bank on them. They're dependent upon how much greenhouse gas we emit, and we have a nice range depending on, you know, what our future trajectory is. Precip is much harder, and we're still struggling in the climate community to figure out how to deal with these precipitation projections. And if the one thing Overpeck and I did in our paper was literally just take the precip out of the equation because it confuses, and, and you can actually think about it as an additive problem, believe it or not. Temps do this, precip does this. And we just said, you know, the best guess here is precip flat. Here's what we know about temps, hence, hence our reductions. Yes, sir, on the right, my right. Yeah, you, yeah. I'm going to ask, um, I'm getting my gut. <laughs> oh, man. So that's, that's, that's state law, right? And recently, the state at least attempted to address some of this with the rain barrel legislation, which, right, which promoted or at least raised this issue that you didn't actually own the water that falls on your roof. Um, I mean, Western water law is pretty arcane, and frankly, to much of the general public, you, they kind of go, you do what and why do you do it? Um, and there's some good historic reasons, and some things are a lot harder to explain. Probably not. I mean, I would tell you, if you want to take the water off your roof, do it. Nobody's ever going to bust you for it. <laughs> yeah. So what mechanism trial rise So the 2007 rules that I've called interim guidelines have a very long title that includes coordinated operation of reservoirs. And so embedded within those rules are rules for when you release from Powell, depending on Powell's elevation and Lake Mead's elevation. They're quite complicated. Some of, them, some of us have actually been picking on them because we don't think they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're, there's a potential for them to be manipulated, unfortunately. Um, and it, there, there's some of us who'd literally like to turn over Lake Mead and Lake Powell to the lower basin and say, you run these two reservoir systems. A little history here. So the Colorado River Compact divided the river 50-50. It gave the upper basin 7.5 million acre feet, gave the lower basin 7.5 million acre feet, gave the lower basin an additional 1 million acre feet for nominally the Gila River in Arizona. Um, right now, the lower basin's using 
on the order of, well, nine, almost 10 million acre feet. So well in excess of what their compact entitlement is, hence this overuse I've talked about, hence the structural deficit, Upper Basin only uses 4.5 million acre feet. They never grew into their 7.5 million acre foot share. Um, and yet the upper basin suffers under what's called a delivery obligation to the lower basin of 75 million acre feet every 10 running years. So it's just 7.5 million acre feet times 10. You can deliver that at any point in time in 10 years. So you have some flexibility. You don't have to do it every year. And what that has done is put the risk of flow declines on the upper basin, which is already using much less than its compact entitlement. And this will clearly be an issue in the 2026 negotiations and how those two reservoirs get operated. I do, the question is whether or not I can find it in any reasonable <laughs> time period. Um, what, what's your question, would you? It's not a question. There's actually a really interesting book called Plagues, Plows, and Petroleum by a scientist named William Ruddeman. And Ruddeman actually has gone back even to the earliest times when humans were growing rice. And rice actually emits methane, right, because it's grown in these swampy environments. And Ruddeman claims you can actually see a human climate signal back then. Um, it's sort of an interesting supposition that even pre-1750, you can see the impacts of humans on our climate. You know, there's another issue that I at least am vaguely familiar with, uh, uh, snowmaking. Um, you really do need those cold temperatures to make snow, and, um, and the colder it is, it, gets, it actually gets quite expensive to make snow when it's warmer. Um, they need, the, ener the process actually needs more energy. Yeah. I just want to interject. You want to call it quits. I want you to call it quits when okay. you're ready. Okay. All right. The rest of the so do you have any final things you want to say? I just want to say, again, thank you to all of you so much for coming. And thank you to Brad for so, a boss man about water and climate change. So I'll stay here and answer questions as long as you want. If, if you want to leave, by all means, do not feel constrained to stay. But I'm happy to stay and answer questions. Yeah.